Hey guys, uh, it's, it's Brendan here. This is uh, this is something new for me. First time doing a live stream here, but uh, I'm, I'm glad everyone uh, joined and and uh, wants to chat some hockey. And I got the game on here right now. The Lightning and, and Panthers just finished up. We got the Blues and Avalanche going at it right now, and and then we can talk some fishing and hopefully get into some stories about. Um, my career and maybe certain players or whatever, but uh, yeah, just looking to have fun with this and, and really just kind of learn what this is all about and have a chance to interact with, uh, with people who enjoy hockey and enjoy fishing. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it and uh, excited to do this. So let's, uh, let's get at it here. Let's, let's get some questions fired at me and, and uh, see if I can get you some good answers. You guys got any thoughts on that on that first game with uh, Tampa and, and uh, Florida? Tampa's uh, Tampa looks good to me. They, um, you know, they, you can tell they've learned how to win here the last couple of years. Even tonight, they completely shut down uh, shut down the Panthers and their offense. All right, we got a first question here. Uh, what would you say was the moment you're proudest of in your hockey career? That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I, that's, it's tough to pinpoint one thing. I, I think memorable moments that stick out is, you know, play, playing your first game and, and uh, you know, extremely proud of getting to the NHL and kind of the, the pinnacle of your, of your field. But, staying there um you know for 14 years and and um i th i think longevity would be a big big part of of this answer here and uh you know i had a pretty good iron man streak there for for years i think i went eight seasons without missing a game so that's something i'd be proud of um you know there's always bumps and bruises that guys play through but you know playing uh over 500 consecutive games would be would be a proud moment and you know, maybe scoring my first NHL goal as well would, would be a proud moment. And that's uh, a couple of things that stick out in my mind. Um, all right. The next one here. I got to ask off the bat, was Bertuzzi a prankster off the ice? You know, I, I think Bert was a little, uh, was a little uh, misread when, when, uh, when we played together, you know, he had this persona of being this big, burly, tough guy, which he was on the ice. Like he was, you know, at the time, you know, I think the best power forward in the game, but behind and, and his kind of front to the media was, you know, very short, very curt, um, didn't have maybe the best interactions with media. So I think people totally had this read on Bert based on what they saw directly in the media. But, you know, behind closed doors, he was he was a very sincere, very caring teammate and uh you know, he, uh, he wasn't a huge prankster. He, uh, he'd pull off the odd joke, but, um, you know, he, uh, he liked to have a good time. There's no question about that. <laughs> do I still talk to Bert and Nazi? Um, I do. Yeah, I do talk to those guys. Uh, Nazi's back in Sweden. He, um, he's been back there, uh, for a while now, about 10 years with his family. And I, I chat with him, I would say probably once a month the odd FaceTime I'll get from him a lot of the last couple I've gotten from Nazi, he's been in, uh, been in, in either Stockholm or he's been in Spain with, uh, Matthias Oland and they've been out having a good time and they FaceTime and they FaceTime me. So those guys are always great to talk to. And, and I do talk to Bert. He, uh, you know, he's living, uh, back in Michigan and, uh, yeah, things are going well for him and, and he's, he's pretty involved with the alumni stuff back there. And, yeah, he's doing well. So I chat with those guys, I'd say, you know, at least once a month each. So, Oh, here we go. we got a, our, our first fishing question. What do you like about the new boat? Well, the new boat, uh, we, we actually, the brand new boat we have, we haven't had a chance to break it in yet. It's getting rigged right now. So we've had uh, Kingfisher 3025 uh, offshore style boats here for the past um three four years filming 
And I personally had one of those I bought back in 2007. So I've had that style boat for a long time, almost 15 years. This year, we're moving into a 3025 GFX. And, you know, it's a little different hull style, a little deeper hull. Um, it's, uh, it's a little heavier boat, about 2,000 pounds heavier. So, yeah, I'm excited to get into it and try it. You know, I've heard a lot of great things about that style of boat. A couple modifications to the back deck. Uh, you know, there's a slide door entering into the cutty and, and instead of having to step down. So a couple minor tweaks like that, that I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, getting out and, and trying out and putting it to the test. We should have that boat ready here probably in a couple of weeks. So end of May, beginning of July. And I think uh, we'll be able to get that out on the water and, uh, and christen it with some fish on it. Okay, question. Were you always a big fisher or was it something you picked up from teammates? Yeah, I, I kind of got into fishing when I was younger. I, I my, my dad wasn't a huge fisherman. He loves to fish with me now, but my grandfather was a big outdoorsman. He, he grew up back in Ontario. He loved to fish. He loved to hunt. And he would come out and visit, you know, probably once a year. And, and I remember vividly a couple of times he uh, he took me to the the trout farm out in in mission and that's that's really where i became hooked so as a young kid you know a lot of times you don't have the most patience and uh but when you go to a trout farm it's like boom automatic every cast you catch a fish so i was <laughs> i thought this is the greatest thing ever every time you cast your line out you hooked a fish and you got to fight it so uh so that's kind of where i think my passion really w was started and then over the years it kind of grew I would say my late teens, early twenties, I really got into it more and more heavily uh, in the summers. I always found it as, I don't, I don't know if escape is the right word, but I always found it relaxing. I found it, uh, it was a, it was also a huge adrenaline rush for me. You know, it was, you know, that moment when you do get a bite kind of electricity in the rod and what do I have on my line? And just, that excitement really uh, was something that I, that I, enjoy, I, I look forward to. And, and it's really growing kind of exponentially since that time. And, and uh, I enjoy all kinds of fishing and, and, uh, and it, it, it excites me. I like it. It's something that really gets me going. Um, is there a team you never played for that you would have wanted to? Uh, you know, I, interesting story i was i was uh i was very close to signing a contract with the montreal canadians when i signed my second year back in calgary we had a deal in place uh, a verbal contract they were just awaiting on some uh, medical records and when the medical records went through it it ended up nullifying the deal so the canadians you know i wasn't a huge canadian fan growing up but my dad that was his favorite team growing up. So I, I think it would have been kind of cool to, to, to play there and, and have that experience and have him, my mom and dad come to a game. And, and uh, you know, I, I think that would have been something special, but uh, you know, other than that, I got to play for my hometown Canucks, which was, uh, which was phenomenal. You know, I was there for seven years and, and uh, got to share that experience with a lot of family and friends, which was pretty unique. Uh, Oh, I got one here uh, from, from Corey. Uh, hey, Brendan, you've likely fished with lots of NHLers, yourself included, of course. Who would you say is the best fisherman and who is the worst fisherman of these ex-current NHLers? Well, there's a lot of, lot of uh, you know, when you're, when you're a hockey player and you tend to have summers off, you either are a golfer or a fisherman. Predominantly guys golf, but there, you, you do have this... Uh, kind of a uh, unique group of guys that enjoy fishing more than golfing. But I would have to give the nod to my buddy, Willie Mitchell. He's, he's been, he's been fishing since he learned how to walk. His dad's had him out on the water since an early age, uh, you know, chasing salmon and he's done a bunch of river fishing and you know, he spent some time down in Florida. So he really got dialed into the, uh, the pelagic fishery down there with swordfish and, and tuna and running outriggers. And he's now brought that, kind of out to Tofino and and uh, Tofino Resort and Marina where he's a part owner and they run an awesome derby out there called the Race for the Blue and and guys are chasing albacore tuna you know up to 70 miles offshore now which you know five ten years ago was unheard of so I'd say Willie worst fisherman 
Man, I gotta go. I gotta go with uh, Roberto Luongo. We had training camp one year in uh, at Bear Mountain, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I convinced Louie and a couple guys to go fishing with me. And uh, the weather wasn't the best. It was a little. Uh, it was actually we we got into this fog bank, and it. So uh, the guys that golfed that day, it was amazingly warm. But we sat in this fog bank all day, and I remember Louie just curled up in the cuddy. <laughs> the entire time in a blanket he wouldn't even come out to the back deck so uh that was pretty comical uh who's winning the battle of alberta who are you rooting for well i i gotta go with the flames i mean i uh i fully understand that the oilers you know have in my opinion the best player in hockey in Connor mcdavid i mean the way he took over uh game six and seven there against la was you just shake your head, like unbelievable. But I think, um, you know, and they obviously have Dry Seidel, who is a top five guy. And but um, I think the Flames, I think the Flames are going to win this series. I think their depth is going to win the series for them. I think, uh, you know, they got three lines that can score. They got a fourth line that's that actually played really well in that uh, Dallas series with uh, Lucic and and Lewis and Richie. Um, they know their role, they're physical, they're big, they create momentum. And, uh, and I like Calgary's back end better. And I think goaltending, you give the edge to Calgary as well. So I think Calgary's deeper overall. So I think I say Calgary is going to win this series in six games. That's, uh, that's my prediction. What league were you in before the NHL? So I, uh, uh, just real quick synopsis. I played my minor hockey out in British Columbia. I played up until the age of 16 in midget. I went to uh, Penticton for one year, played in the BCHL for the Penticton Panthers at the time. And uh, then I got a scholarship to the University of Michigan. So I went to Michigan um, when I was 18. I stayed there for four years. Uh, prior to going into school, I was drafted by New Jersey. So when I came out of school, went to training camp with New Jersey was one of the last cuts with the Devils. Spent most of my first year in uh, in Albany, which was their minor league team in the AHL. Was called up up a couple times that year. Got to play in the playoffs that year, and then uh, the following season was uh, a full time player with the Devils. So that's kind of the route I took going to university. Uh, what did you dislike playing? Uh, who did who did you dislike playing against more? The Oilers or the Flames? Oh man, I, I when I was in Vancouver, I I, I disliked them both. You know, I, I I didn't like either of them. Um, I per, I actually liked playing against them because for whatever reason, I, I I scored a bunch against both of those teams. So <laughs> anytime I saw them on the schedule, I was happy actually, especially if I was in in a bit of a scoring slump. Um, but uh, we had uh, I never got to play the Oilers in the playoffs. You know, we when I was with Vancouver. Obviously, we played Calgary in uh, in 0304 there, and, and had a, a pretty uh, pretty dynamite series. And, and um, we know what happened there. Uh, the Canucks lost in overtime at home, and Calgary went on to win that game and went to the Stanley Cup Finals. If you could only fish one spot in BC, where would you go? Ooh, man. Whew, that's a tough one too. Like, geez. You know, I, I spend a lot of time in Tofino on the West Coast, and, and uh, I really like that fishery there because it's uh, it's pretty diverse. You you get salmon. You might not get the size that you would get in Rivers Inlet or Hakai Pass or even up in in the Haida Gwaii, but you get numbers of fish. Plus, you get great halibut fishing, ling cod fishing. But I think the thing that kind of puts it over the top is also um, – you know, black cod and tuna fishing, you know, depending on the water temperature, a couple of years ago, those tuna were only uh, 30 miles offshore. So just having that diversity there in Tofino would probably put that at the top of my list. When you met Sean Morrison in Washington, were you like, dude, WTF, why did your parents spell your name like that? <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, you know, I did. I did think that. I actually did. I was like, "What? Wow, what? How do you?" Say? I just kind of kept quiet to see what the other guys would call him. Was it? Was it Shane? Was it Sean? 
okay, all right. Hey, Sean, what's up, dude? So, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I didn't know. But, uh, that was, I, you know, I should have asked him why or how he ever came up with that. That's pretty unique. I've never seen that. And uh, that cracks me up that, uh, that you're thinking the same thing here. <laughs> What's your biggest fish this year? My biggest fish this year. So I've only, I've only actually been out fishing a couple of times. I, I've uh, fished on the Bull River a couple of times. Got some nice rainbows. I haven't got any browns yet, but uh, we uh, we filmed an episode here about a month ago on the Sunshine Coast chasing humongous rainbow trout uh, in Powell River, and uh, I. I got a rainbow that was probably 14, maybe 15 pounds. So that would, uh, that's, that's my biggest fish this year so far. So hopefully we'll be broken here in the next month when I get salmon fishing and halibut. Uh, do you do any hunting in the fishing off season? Yeah. You know, I, I, I do actually, I, um, I never grew up in a hunting family. Again, my, my, my dad didn't do it. Um, you know, I had a lot of buddies that did it. I just loved fishing. But when I retired from hockey, uh, I was 36. And I had a good buddy here in town uh, in, in Calgary, Jeff Sanderson, who was my teammate in Vancouver. And we fished a lot together. Our, our boys played hockey together. And so Sandy, you know, kind of talked me into going out hunting with him. And I, and I said, man, I, I don't know if this is for me. Like, uh, but I'll come. I'll come and I'll give it a chance. I'll check it out. Well, I, uh, I gotta be honest. I, I love it. I absolutely love it. I love being outside. I love, uh, hiking around. I love the physicality. It's great exercise. Um, the things you see in the morning when the sun comes up, it'll blow your mind. So I'm, um, I'm fully on board with it. You know, I, uh, you know, we, we, uh, my family eats, eats everything that, uh, that I harvest. And, and, um, I can tell you the last time I went to the grocery store to buy meat, we got, elk in the freezer we got venison so we're, we're and fish we're pretty spoiled like very very spoiled uh do you prefer fresh water or salt water you know what i prefer where the fish are biting <laughs> i'll be honest i mean they're two totally different games it's uh and they both have their, their positives and, and and negatives i think you know obviously on the ocean you know the biggest factor for me out there is, is the weather right it can be very very bad um, especially on the west coast rollers fog you know i mean you can have bad weather on on a lake or a river too but uh you never have a situation where waves are coming over the top of your boat i mean i guess that can happen on fresh water but um typically that's that's the scenario that you get into on the ocean or you don't want to get into on the ocean it can be uh pretty unsettling but um you know i i like both of them for for different reasons um you know they're both challenging you know fresh water obviously you can fly fish and, and uh spin cast and you have different methods there um uh, you can fly fish on the ocean too but uh yeah man i i can't answer that question i, I really don't have uh, a preference one way or the other uh enjoyed your episode with jason tonelli what do you think about all the closures around the lower mainland looking for local spots to fish yeah you know that obviously this is a pretty uh sensitive issue um in the fishing industry right now uh sports fishing especially um you know i here, here's where i stand on it do i think there are some stocks of concern that that we need to be careful about yes i do but i also believe there are healthy stocks of fish that sports fishermen should be allowed to harvest so um you know the sports fishermen are kind of like stewards of the ocean i mean um, they collect significant amount of data you know har not harvesting fish just clipping fish uh, writing down information, sending in samples, where are these fish from, where are they going to? I mean, there's been decades of, of, of uh, information like this, and, and, it, and it's frustrating when, when um, certain decisions made by, you know, uh, government don't reflect what we're seeing out on the water. So, I mean, I, I could talk about this all day, and, and uh, you can get into killer whales you can get sea lions and all that stuff but but i think there's a happy medium there like uh 
I also believe we have, um, you know, we have uh, uh, clip clip fish or hatchery fish for a reason, right? For so people can harvest them. So, and and the, but the problem in BC is we only we only clip about ten percent of our fish. So, I mean, it's more money needs to be allocated to that program, uh, and we need to sort this out. But uh, yeah, I think completely to shutting everything down, it's you know, I, I don't, I don't think it solves the, the issue with, um, with some of these, uh, um, you know, protective runs, like some Thompson fish that are going up. Uh, some of the bigger issues are nets in the river. And again, we can talk about this all day. So I, I do think we get, there's a happy medium somewhere. Uh, favorite West Van Isle place to fish. Yeah. You know, we just chatted about that. I mean, there's so many great spots, right. But again, I'm partial to Tofino you know, a big reason I've, I've spent most of my time there, you know, I have been to Cayucat, I've been to Nootka, I've been up to Quatsino, uh, fish down in, in Banfield, Souk, been lucky to fish all over the coast, but I just know Tofino more intimately. So for me, that's, that's kind of where I would, uh, give the nod to. Do you run braided line on your single action reels? You know what? It, I, in the past, I haven't, but I am going to make the switch over this year. I've been doing a lot of research and talking to guys about it. So, um, you know, probably, you know, put a signif some backing on that mooching reel, followed by some braid, probably 50 to 65 pound braid, then have a top shot of mono of about maybe 30 yards, so 100 feet. So, you know, especially on the West Coast, when you're fishing so deep, this is the main reason why you'd want braid. It's so much more sensitive. So, you know, you have that braided line is, and especially, if, you know, there's been times when I'm on my downriggers at you know, 180, 200 feet. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's tough to see bites if it, if, uh, but if you have that braided line, there's no give at all. You'll see that bite right away. So I think that's, uh, that's what I'm going to do is, is re respool a lot of my, my Islanders this year and, and, uh, have that braid top shot with the mono system. Who is the most underrated teammate in your opinion? Someone that didn't get enough attention for all their skill. Hmm. 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 Well, um, yeah, I've been, I've been lucky to play with a lot of, a lot of different guys. Um, you know, I, in Vancouver, you know, some guys that stand out and, and I guess like, you know, Matthias Oland got attention, but I mean, he was an absolute horse back on D for us. Um, you know, obviously Marcus and Todd got a lot of attention, um, you know, it, it, it took Daniel and Hendrick quite a while before they kind of got the credit they deserved. They, they, they took a lot of heat early in their career um, and obviously continued to push, push forward and move on and, and had phenomenal careers and deserved everything they got. You know, one, one of the most talented guys I ever played with was, was in Washington. Um, you know, I was, I was lucky enough to play with Ovechkin. He scored 52 that year. And, but I played with uh, Alex Salmon. And I don't know if, if I've played with a guy that has had more skill than this guy, but he just, he didn't care. Like he just didn't care, but you watch this guy in practice. Like he could throw a saucer pass from one end of the rink to the end, other end of the rink. You just put your stick down and he'd hit it nine out of 10 times. Like it was ridiculous. And uh, he was big. He was strong. He could shoot the puck. He could skate, but he could care less. It was so frustrating. So that, that might be one of the, mo the most talented guy I ever played with. What do you think about the current Canucks roster? Who needs to stay? Who needs to go? Curious to hear your thoughts. Well, I mean, uh, you know, Vancouver's close. They, they, uh, to making that next, next step here. They got, um, I think they have a good core of guys. I like their core. You know, um, you, Quinn Hughes, Patterson, Horvat, uh, obviously Miller. They they have some decisions to make. Besser. So, you know, in this in this salary cap era, there's um, there's decisions you got to make every year. And guys, I think someone's getting moved out of there. I don't know who it's going to be. I mean, and I I, I feel for Besser this year. Obviously, personally, he had a lot on his plate. And, 
you know, hockey players, athletes, you know, guys are human beings. So I mean, they're just not robotic. It's, it's hard to shut off things that are affecting you in your life when you go to your job. And I think with his performance this year, like as far as goal output, you know, when you're paying, in a, paying a guy seven and a half, his, his job is to score goals. But, you know, you, you got you to gotta take into consideration some of the things he went through. But, you know, so I, I think qualifying Besser at that seven five is, you know, if, they, if they're going to look to sign him long term, I think they have to get that number down. Um, you know, I do think he's an asset, but I don't know. It's tough, right? Like it's, you know, I, I, I was a big Tyler Mott fan. I uh, was disappointed to see him go. I thought he brought a lot of energy to that team. And I thought he had more upside offensively than, than he'd really been given the opportunity. I think the start of the year too, having Pedersen and, and Hughes miss camp, it didn't affect Hughes as much as it affected Pedersen. It took him a long time to get back on track and, he did that the last half quarter of the season. He played unreal, but by that time it was almost too little, too late. So I don't know. I mean, there's, there's, uh, you know, that's just kind of a, a 10,000 foot view without getting into too much minutia about it. But uh, I, I, I think they're close. I think, uh, I think they're a playoff team next year. I do think they get in. I think they have a, a franchise goalie in Demko and they can build out from, from that back end. Can you tell me where mystery man Kipper is? <laughs> we saw you did a fishing trip with him a few years back. The old Kipper. Yeah, he's, uh, he's back in Finland. He's, uh, he, uh, he went back home and, and he's actually, he's involved with, uh, I think his hometown team. He, he's part owner of a team. I can't remember exactly which team it is in back in uh, Finland there, but uh, great man, great guy. And just became addicted to fishing late in his career. He lived uh, south of Calgary, right on the Bow River. So he was out there anytime, any chance he could get. But uh, a very, very funny demeanor, like a super quiet guy. If, if you didn't know him, you wouldn't think that he, he ever talked. But you get, him, you get him at the back of the plane or the back of the bus. And the guy was, uh, he was uh, a comedian. Uh, a lot of good times being around Kipper. I'm a fisherman and full right goalie. Who was the toughest full right tender that you faced in your career? Man, those, those right-handed goalies always threw me off. Like uh, early in my career, like Tom Barrasso was a right-hander with the Penguins. Turns out I actually scored my first NHL goal, my first shot on term, Tom Barrasso in the igloo. So I didn't have an issue with Tom Brasso, but uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, uh, I'd say uh, probably Jose Theodore in, uh, in Montreal there and actually was his teammate in Washington in uh, 2009, 2010. Again, another, another great guy. I played with him in the World Championships as well. But, uh, yeah, he was tough to score on in practice. And that's just that unorthodox style. You're just not used to shooting on those guys. Hey, Bimo, fellow number seven, what was your favorite over-the-top locker room prank that happened in Vancouver? Well, we guys are always joking around. There's a couple that, uh, that I was a part of and a couple that I wasn't a part of that are pretty legendary. So, you know, the standard one, the one that never gets old is, you know, guys are – you have six guys in the shower or whatever, and you get a guy that come in, he's just waiting for a, for a stall to get open and you just, it never fails, right? You have two stacks of towels, guy just grabs the shaving cream, just fills up the inside of the towel with the shaving cream, just innocently walk in like nothing happened. Next thing you know, your buddy's out there <laughs> just drying himself off the towel, right? And he really has no idea what's going on because the towel's facing him. And next thing you know, he's just covered <laughs> cover all over his body in the shaving cream like I know it's such a silly joke but it never gets old like guys to die and laughing all the time uh one time we had uh Matt Matt Cook came to practice and he had this old like he was so proud of this like cardigan sweater he had on it was like it, it was very very suspect but he just was like this is the best thing ever man like he was so proud of it. So the guys were talking, we got to do something with that sweater. So um, 
we got to retire the sweater. We got to retire it. Like this thing is so God awful. We got to get it out of here. So we arranged when we went out onto practice to have someone sneak into the locker room and, and, uh, and grab that sweater. And, and it was at uh, the old GM place there, Rogers arena. And we, we had the sweater hung up in the rafters. <laughs> so cookie had no idea that thing was up there until someone pointed it out to him and said, Hey, Cookie, I see that your your jersey got retired. He's like, what are you talking about? And uh, so he's looking around for the longest time. Finally, he sees his sweater hanging up in the rafters. That thing was terrible. And then um, I've heard some other ones that are great, like, you know, a guy getting traded, like, in practice. So he leaves the ice and, uh, you know, goes into the locker room, the change room where all the guys have their uh, – and takes all their car keys – house keys off of their keychains and puts them in a big bowl so nobody has any idea what what their house key is their car keys it took like two weeks for guys to figure out they'd go home be trying to open their door with certain keys couldn't get into their house that's a good one man that's uh that's really stirring the pot uh what do we got here hey what got you into fishing and what made you start your own show? Well, again, going back, uh, I talked about it a bit earlier was, uh, was my grandpa. He's kind of the guy that introduced me to fishing. Like, uh, now my, you know, my dad loves spending time with me on the boat and we can chat and, and, and have time together. But, uh, when my grandfather came out from Ontario, he, he would take me out to the trout farm there in mission. And, uh, that's kind of where I got hooked. And uh, what made me to start my own show? So I, I co-hosted the show a couple couple years with um, called Sport Fishing Adventures and uh, Mike Mitchell from BC Outdoors. When I was playing, he had me on his show as a guest a couple times, and you know I always thought, man, this is uh, this this might be something I'm, I, I could be interested in, in doing one day. And it just kind of evolved. Like uh, when I retired from from hockey. Um, Mike invited me to be a part of a show. So I went and did that. I co-hosted it for three, four years. And then uh, I kind of had a vision of, of how, I, how I wanted the show to go and wanted to kind of shoot more of an adventure style show and, and uh, you know, really talk about the journey of fishing and, and you know, really taking in your surroundings, your, the whole experience, not just catching fish. Like catching fish is awesome. And, and that's kind of the premise of the show. But we, we really wanted to showcase the other things like, so conservation and, and culture and so that's why we why i branched out and, and started my own show and it's been awesome i've been uh been very fortunate very lucky to go to some some unbelievable places and uh catch you know many different species of fish and you know i still enjoy doing it i have a lot of fun i hope that never leaves me i i, I really want to kind of share that passion with with the viewers and you know every time i hook a fish i'm just hollering like a little kid so keeps me young do you have a favorite fly fishing spot um i i man well I, being in calgary here i i fished the bull river you know a few times but i'm never really here for prime time because i spend a lot of time in bc but um you know, I like to try different spots all the time. I don't have like one set spot that I go to all the time. So uh, I've been to some phenomenal places. Like last year, I, I went to uh, went to a lodge called Northern Lights Lodge up in uh, the Caribou in uh, Likely, BC. And they took us into a couple of their, uh, you know, they call it secret lakes. And man, it was some of the best fly fishing I've ever had in my life. Like big trout and you know um all surface takes all dry fly stuff like big caddis big sedge patterns on the surface and if you saw a fish rise if you could get your fly to that ring within three to five seconds you'd hook that fish 90 percent of the time so um that was pretty remarkable a couple of years ago we went to uh northern rockies lodge up in up in uh Muncho Lake and and from there you actually have the opportunity to do fly-ins to different lakes and that was incredible too. fly fishing for pike fly fishing for uh for arctic grayling it was it was off the charts like it was it was phenomenal 
But around here, yeah, I, I go on the on the bow with my buddy Jeff Sanderson. We we float it. We just try to target different spots, and but there isn't one spot that I go to all the time. I like to try and experience different things. Never fished Tofino. Who would you recommend to charter for a first trip in Tofino? Oh man, you know I'm lucky. I've been there for. Well, I've been going over to Tofino since my mom was pregnant with me in her stomach in the mid seventies. So I spent a lot of time there and, and it befriended a lot of guys. Uh, there's so many good fishermen over there, you know, guys, uh, man, like, uh, Lance from Lance's sport fishing, uh, charter Tofino there, uh, Kelly Aspinall. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of great guys, you know, uh, Tofino resort and Marina. They have guys that fish out of there as well. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of guys. If you want uh, contact info, just DM us and we can send you a bunch of contact information. Um, I just got distracted here by this Colorado game. Sorry. <laughs> Why nothing uh, St. Louis here? I think this is going to be a good series. Okay, here we go. On a scale of 1 to 10, how terrifying is it to look up and see Lucic as you lined up for a hit? Uh, yeah, that's a 10. 10 plus. Uh, he's a big, scary man, and he likes to finish his checks. I uh, I tried to avoid him at all costs. New to ocean fishing, how do you guys ever broke down offshore? How did you handle it? Well, I think the biggest thing is just is uh, if you have your own boat, do a buddy system with guys that know what they're doing, or bring guys on your boat who have experience. That's how you learn. Watching these guys, how they run, what are they using. So I just kind of did that over years, over years. And you build up confidence where, you know, hey, man, I can do this on my own now. I feel comfortable enough. I can go out. And, and it's rewarding. Once you get out there on your own and you start catching fish, you're like, man, I got this. You know, I'm never going to say you got it figured out because every day is, is different. Some days you have it figured out. Some days you don't. But it's really rewarding um, when you get out there and you catch fish. But go with guys who have experience early on. That's the quickest way to learn. Are you going to fish the caribou for Lakers and Kokanee? We would love to meet the real West Coast crew on the water one day. You know what? I'd love to go back to the to the Kootenays there, or uh, sorry, the caribou for for big Lakers. Um, that's actually something on our list to do is chasing big Lakers and uh, and Kokanee. So that we've caught a couple Lakers on the show. We've actually never got Kokanee, so that's uh, that's that's something that we're interested in doing. Absolutely. In terms of hunting, are you a spot and stock or long range kind of guy? Well, I'll be honest, my favorite kind of hunting is with my compound bow. So um, my, my passion would be elk hunting, uh, you know, come September. And I'm just, I, I just hone in. All I can do is hear bugles everywhere. But uh, yeah, I, I love the intimacy of it. Uh, getting close. It's, it's, a, it's a technical game, man. The wind, the, you know, moving slowly. I love the challenge of putting the game plan together and see if you can actually execute it. You know, with that being said, I have taken animals with my rifle and uh, long distance, but my preference is definitely uh, up close with my bull. What's your favorite a spoon, hoochie, and plug color? And do you reference hockey player numbers to death? <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely do reference hockey player numbers at depths sometimes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I do for sure. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, Again, I, I don't have a, a certain number. It's about, you got to figure out where those fish are. But I do, I do typically tend to fish on odd numbers more than even numbers. I don't know why. I can't tell you why. I mean, I wore seven pretty much all my life in hockey. And then when I went to college and, and the NHL, I was nine. And then I kind of jumped around to some other numbers like eight and 17. But I, I typically fish uh, even over odd numbers. Last couple of years, the, the skinny G has been a, you know, been a killer spoon for me. The um, herring aid pattern has, has probably been my most successful pattern for sure with spoons. Uh, I don't fish a ton of plugs anymore, to be honest. Uh, the bait has kind of changed off the uh, off the west coast. Plugs are plugs are really good on the inside there, outside of Nanaimo and and uh, Parksville, Qualcomm. But uh, you know, the plug plug fishing has kind of slowed down a bit on the west coast. And hoochies, you know, the typical West Coast, the turd, which is kind of a brown hoochie or uh, a certain times of year, just like a UV or a white uh, hoochie kind of imitating a squid is, is deadly. 
Uh, do you have, do you have any kids? Do they play hockey? I do. I have four kids. Uh, um, my kids are getting old now. I got, I got a, I got a son who's 20, just turned 20 here last week. He's uh, he's a, he was a freshman at the university of Wisconsin this year. He's playing hockey there. I got an 18 year old daughter who uh, was a freshman at uh, Miami of Ohio playing soccer. Boom. Avalanche just scored update. Um, and then I have a 16 year old daughter here that plays soccer. And then I have a 13 year old daughter that plays hockey and soccer. So active kids, they're all good kids. Super proud of them. Uh, have you thought of doing an episode during the fun chaos of the Port Alberni Sockeye run? Yeah, I've actually fished that before and it's mayhem. I hear what you're saying. Like, it's a funny story. So the first time I went to go fish them, for whatever reason, we got a really late start. We didn't launch until like 7.30 and all these boats were coming in already. We're like, what's going on here? We have the whole day to fish. They're like, no, it's over. You guys missed it. I'm like, what do you mean missed it? Like. So anyway, we're like, what are these people talking about? So we went out and fished. <laughs> we didn't touch a fish. We're like, maybe we missed it. So they're like, no, you got to be out here like in the dark, get set up and be ready to go at first light. So the next morning we went out, we, I think we got down there at 4.30. We were on the water right at first light and we hammered them. But uh, yeah, that's a fun fishery, man. And it's like, it's almost like tuna fishing. Like when you find the fish, it's like not one rod goes, like every rod goes off uh would you ever work for the canucks say maybe as a scout uh well you know like when i when i first retired from hockey uh, 10 years ago i actually was offered a, a very good job with the canucks and i and i turned it down um you know simply because i wanted to be around the family and I, and i felt i owed it to my kids to be here and uh, support them growing up um you know, I, I, I think it would have been an awesome job to do that. I just, I just didn't want to travel 10 to 14 days a month right after I had retired. Um, you know, I, I would never rule out getting back into the game. I still follow it. I, I'm in tune with it. I, I love the game. Um, if the absolute right job opportunity came, came along, I would seriously consider it. Um, my kids are getting older and, and kind of moving out of the house here now. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Who do you think should get the C in Calgary? Well, um, I think it depends on what happens here after the playoffs with, um, you know, if they're going to be able to keep, keep both Kachuk, Goudreau, they got to, they got to sign a few guys, obviously Majapani, um, you know, I, I, Lindholm as well. I, I really, I really love his game. I, I, I uh, you know, like his 200 foot game. I, I think he would be a great candidate. Um, you know, I, I it's, uh, I think Majopani could be in that mix. You know, Kachuk's in there, although I think he, you know, he, he's too much extracurricular to, to wear that C, I think. Um, but, uh, I don't know. They got a handful of good options for sure. Uh, now that you've been removed from your career for several years, can you talk about your happiest memory as well as your most frustrating memory when it comes to the playoffs? Yeah. Hey, Melissa, Melissa, geez, I've known, known her since, uh, I was a young kid back in New Jersey. I met, first met Melissa probably back in 1998 or 99. I hope you're doing well. Um, you know, I think some of my hap my happiest memories was, you know, just kind of as cliche as it sounds, just the friendships you make, being in the locker room. Like when I think back to my hockey days, a lot of times I don't think of specific moments in games. I think of times in the in the dressing room and 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 uh, that atmosphere. I mean, yes, there are certain moments that stick out, like you know your your first goal. Um, you know, I, I think about my my la my first game, and I think about my last game a lot. Um, you know, because it was a playoff game. I was in Chicago at the time. You know, was there anything I could have done differently? Uh, what could I have done? What else could I have done in that game where we might have had a chance to win that series? So I, I do think about things like that. There's no question. I think the most frustrating thing for me, probably, probably two come to mind. Well, three. One is. Is is just I just up to the age of thirty I was I was very versatile very healthy after thirty 
I ran into a handful of injuries that were just, you know, very, very frustrating. I blew up both my ACLs. I had hip surgery. I had a hernia surgery. I had both my wrists operated on. But especially my knees, I had two really tough years when I came back from my knee surgery. It just, you know, a big part of my game was skating and just, I just couldn't get the spot. So that, that was frustrating for me. Mentally, even when I retired, mentally, I felt great. I just physically, you know, I just, that, that's, that's ma- the main reason why for me. But um, I would go back to the 2000, 2000, uh, three um, playoffs with the Canucks when we uh, we were up 3-1 against Minnesota. And we ended up losing that series in, in seven games on home ice. That, that was, uh, I still think back to that series quite a bit and wish that things would have ended differently. And then um, my time in Washington, we won the President's Trophy that year. And I, and I truly felt that team was going to go to the Stanley Cup Finals. And then it was a coin toss whatever happened but we got upset by montreal in the first round and yeah i I think about that one a lot too i mean it's uh some nightmares at times how creepy is gary batman in real life did did your hair (laughs) gary batman i always (laughs) i always nicknamed him the count he's like uh from sesame street but uh you know i've had i've had a chance to meet him a couple times um you know you see him on tv and and his mannerisms, you know, it's, uh, you know, I don't think it's too endearing to the fans, but he's, he, he's a brilliant man. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. He, he's, uh, he, he's phenomenally smart. I mean, the owners absolutely love him for what he's done for the game of hockey, as far as growing the game, increasing franchise values. Um, you know, I, I, he just doesn't come across as, a guy you would like to hang out with, right? Like he doesn't seem very personable at all. It's just uh, this strictly business and and that's the only side you see. Um, what do you look for when looking for hall, Halley areas? Are they the same as Ling spots? A uh, little bit different. Like I think Ling's, Ling's are strictly rock piles, right? You're looking for pinnacles on the bottom of the water. Uh, so if you have a good uh, G- GPS system or sonar, I mean, honestly, when you see rock pinnacles, there's a good chance you're going to find a link cod there. Now, halibut typically don't hang out on those pinnacles, but if you see, uh, you know, like a pebbly area, like is, that is, or a rock area that's gradually built up and there's sand on the outside, that's where those halibut like to hang out. They'll hang out on the edge of those sand flats. So. That's uh, that's what I try and try and target. <laughs> when you go on the BC ferries, do you set your alarm, <laughs> man? Like I'm a pretty easygoing guy, pretty relaxed, but there are a couple of things that drive me absolutely friggin' crazy. One, alarms on the BC ferry. Yes, I sent out that PSA a couple of weeks ago in jest, but it was how I felt. Like, dude. You don't need to lock your car and set your line. Okay, I get locking your car if you have valuables inside. You might have a pet inside. I get that. Fully get it. But to double click your fob and engage the alarm, there should be a fine for that. That's ridiculous. But anyways, um, so no, I do not set my alarm. And the other thing that drives me absolutely berserk is uh, on an airplane. When the plane lands... And next thing you know, people just jam into the aisle. Like, really? Like, you don't think we don't want to get off the plane too? Like, okay, if you have a connecting flight and you're in a rush, okay, I get it. I get it. Maybe talk to the stewardess or, sorry, the flight attendant and, uh, you know, advise them, hey, or check in, hey, or maybe they make an announcement, but, just stand up, grab your bag, and jam the aisle. It's like, oh, it drives me nuts. I can't can't handle it. Oh yeah, and people that leave their blinkers on too, that drives me nuts. Um, <laughs> how heavy was your biggest spring out of the Skeena River, and what is the funniest thing you allowed to tell that Sopel has done? <laughs> oh, Sopel was a good teammate, man. He was a good dude. He. Uh, 
he laid his body on the line, but um, he, uh, I remember one year, I don't know if it was at, at the end of, it might've been at the end of our 2002 season, but so his contract was up and, and he was having a bit of a contract dispute, but um, our, that was absolutely phenomenal save by Bennington. Oh my, he just, well, I think he just dislocated his shoulder and he just put it back in its socket. Oh my God. <laughs> But with Soapy, they told him he needed to get stronger. So training camp starts, and all the guys uh, are back at camp. But Soapy's not there yet because he's got uh, he's got um, you know his contracts uh, issue he's dealing with. So he finally signs. We're like two, three weeks into camp, and uh, Soapy comes back, and he's like 25, 30 pounds heavier, and he is like walking around. He's like the Incredible Hulk. Like he can barely even turn and guys like Soapy, like, dude, what, how did you get, what happened this summer, man? Oh, I was on this really strict diet. Like I ate 12 chicken breasts a day. I'd eat like 15 eggs. I'd set my alarm at, at nighttime. I'd get up, I'd eat more eggs. And we're like, oh yeah, okay. But uh, he gets on the ice and he can barely skate. He can barely skate because he's so much heavier. So I remember Crow, uh, Mark Crawford was on the bench and uh, it was in one of our last exhibition games. He's just giving it to Soapy at the end of the bat. Like, oh, Soapy, you can't even turn, you can't skate. And Soapy's like just eyeballing him and Crow's like, what are you going to do now? Are you going to turn green on me? <laughs> so, oh, you, that was that was pretty funny. Oh, man. But uh, biggest spring uh, out of the Skeena. Mm, the biggest spring I ever got was up in the, in the Haida Gwaii. There was taped out to be 52. I released it. Um, out of the Skeena, probably a Taiyi. Yeah, I never, I've never kept anything big out of the Skeena. I've, I've always released everything up there, but I know there's uh, huge genetics in that river for sure. Uh, any significance behind numbers you've used, like seven? You know, seven was just, uh, just my child, favorite number as a child I, I did i just love number seven i don't know i don't know why i just i just love that number so i wore it my entire minor hockey career and um when i went to go to junior hockey number seven was already taken by a veteran player so i took 17 uh because i still wanted to have seven in the number and then when i went to college seven and 17 were gone so I figured number nine, that sounds like a good number. There's a lot of, a lot of players that have worn that number over the years and it was close to seven. So that, that was kind of it. And then it, it's funny how it evolved. So when I went to Jersey, uh, seven was gone. So I got nine. And then when I came to Vancouver, seven was open. So I immediately went right back to seven. So when you go to a new team, you know, your number might be taken. So you got to obviously be open to other ideas. Like for example, when I came to um, Calgary, it, it was funny. I was talking to the trainer on the phone, uh, Mark De Pasquale and uh, Corey Osgood. And I think they had like three numbers available. They said, yeah, we got number eight. We got number 27 or 28, not 28. Cause Reggie was wearing that Rob McGear and like th three numbers. I, honestly, I just put the phone up. I muted it. I just said to my kids, what do you guys think? Like, what number should I wear? And they're like, eight. I'm like, okay, number eight sounds good. <laughs> it was between seven and nine. It was close enough. Uh, let's see here. We want to get into tuna fishing on the West Coast. Any tips on how to get started? We have a Kingfisher 3025. Love your outrigger setup. Yeah, I mean, you guys got the perfect boat to do it. Uh, I think... Um, you know, watch some of our episodes. You just talk to guys that have done it, like going to tackle shops. Like I know on, on Vancouver Island, like Pacific Net and Twine, uh, Harbor Chandler, those guys are, are pretty dialed in with, with the tuna fishing. Um, you know, another great idea is, is to go out with a guide, like actually pay money and go out with a guide for the day to see how they run things, see how their setup is. And, um, you know, it's like anything. Once you do it a couple of times, you get the hang of it. There's a couple kind of uh, intricacies you're looking for, like you're looking for temperature breaks in the water. You're looking for birds. You know, all these things kind of add up uh, to success on the water. But uh, yeah, you guys, 
it, it's an awesome experience. Like it's a different world out there. When you get offshore, it's just, uh, it's like you're in Hawaii or Mexico. Uh, since food is so expensive, would you say fishing is profitable for an average Joe to just to Chilliwack river cat salmon for the week? You know what? Like with the price of gas these days, I don't know how profitable it is. I, I like to call, uh, fishing and hunting to me. I tell people their lifestyle investments. So it's something that brings me pleasure. It brings me joy. I have a lot of fun doing it. I have a lot of great memories. Well, Avalanche just tallied again. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess if you don't, if you don't have too far to go, but I, you know, you know, we're, the resources we have out in, 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 on the West here, are, we're spoiled, right? To be able to go out, catch fresh fish, you know, you can, you can crab, you can prawn if you're on the ocean, you know, if, if, if you're into hunting, you can harvest, you know, uh, food that way. It's, uh, it's dynamo. Like, uh, yeah. Um, so I don't know if I would call it profitable. I think that might be a stretch, but I look at it as, I look at it as a lifestyle investment. Out of all the teams that didn't make the playoffs this year, who do you think has the best chance next year? Well, I do. I think Vancouver's right there. Like I do. I think their start was horrendous. I think, um, they learned some things. I think guys got more experience. So I think Vancouver, uh, I think Vancouver is a playoff team next year. Yeah, I, I do. I do. Um, have you ever thought about adding co cooking your catch to the show? Absolutely. We, we have talked about that. And uh, I think at some point this year we'll do that. Um, you know, it's uh, cooking in my family is, is a huge thing. My, my wife, I'm, I'm spoiled. She's and my kids are spoiled. She's a phenomenal cook uh like loves to make everything from scratch you know what f at, f from mayonnaise to whatever you name it she makes everything from scratch it's awesome but uh yeah we would like to showcase that a bit more and and um and that's something we're, we're working on for sure uh hey vic a message from vic here a great job with the show brendan i remember when you first started promoting fishing floats at the rattle and big rock show yeah is that something you're still involved in? And what is the name of the, of the float? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, uh, me and a buddy of mine, uh, Walter Corrieth from Maple Ridge, we, uh, we, uh, we distribute floats. Um, they're called top shelf premium floats. And they're made from, uh, they're made in Germany. They're uh, uh, made of a, a material called Roja cell. It's a closed, uh, closed uh, cell foam, which is, you know, more durable, more buoyant. Um, you can, you can get them at some local shops, um, sea run flying tackle, you can get them at Fred's, you can, uh, you can, you can get a hold of us directly. We have a, a website online, but, uh, yeah, they're, they're awesome floats. We have strike indicators from a half a gram up to three grams for fly fishing. They're awesome for still water. And then we have floats in, in river sizes from, from four grams all the way up to 35 grams. So. If you want to fish trout, if you want to fish uh, salmon, steelhead, they, uh, you know, you can call me biased. I've tried a bunch of different floats. In my opinion, there's, there's no, uh, no comparison, but yeah, top shelf premium floats. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that mention there, Vic. Is there a show or person who inspired Real West Coast show style? Do you watch any other outdoor shows like Survivor Man, Meat Eater? Yeah. You know, like Survivor Man would be uh, one of the first kind of, uh, I guess authentic uh, reality shows that 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 aired, and, and I was a huge fan of Les Stroud, and uh, you know Steve Rinalis from from Meat Eater. I, I love uh, what he's doing in his content. But interesting enough, uh, years ago when I was still playing, um, we had this uh, NHL challenge with Survivor Man. So Brad May set this up. I don't even know if it's got to be online somewhere. Um, so we flew back to uh, Toronto and then we flew up to this small town in Northern Ontario called Hornpain. And we had like 12 guys and we had some sponsors. We had referees, we had some players, sponsors. So they divided us up into, I can't remember if it was four or five teams. So Les, <laughs> Les was there and he gave us a big rundown of, of what, what to expect. Uh, we had to, you know, we had to, we, 
we had to show them that we could build a lean to, we had to show them we could start a fire without matches, like just with Flint. And uh, basically we were going to go out to remote locations, get dropped off by float planes. And we had to rendezvous, we had a GPS and we had to rendezvous back at a, at a checkpoint. Um, and it was supposed to be for two days. So after we did some training with Les, <laughs> he said, you guys can't, you guys won't be able to make it for two days one day only. So we only, we cut it down to one day, but I remember, um, so my team got flown out. We got dropped off on this beaver dam in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, you had the GPS and we had nothing like he wouldn't allow us to take anything. Like I had all my stuff packed, ready to go. He's like, no, no, no. You guys who have backpacks, turn around back in your room. You go, you go in with what's on your back. So we show up, they give these coordinates to this cash like a, a checkpoint with some, uh, like a cash checkpoint. So they had a bunch of different things there and they said, you can take two out of five items. There was like a tarp, there was matches, there was like fishing line, um, there was uh, hooks. So you had to make these decisions. Hey, what do we need? Like a uh, um, bag of beef jerky, there was a bag of rice. So you had to kind of decide what do we need to survive here for the night? It was actually super cool. We had a great time and, and, uh, you know, built her lean to, had to keep her fire going all night. That, that, that was a lot of fun. Uh, do you have any memories you'd like to share about your time with the Caps? Yeah, man, it was a great season. Like, we won the President's Trophy. Yeah, I think we had 123 points. Like, I kind of, des I describe it to people as we were, a, we were a traveling rock show. Like, that was Obi Mania. You know, that was like the fifth year Obi had been in the league. Every rink we went to, it was jam packed. Like the warm ups were jam packed. It was it was crazy. Like uh, I had a lot of fun that year. Good good young group of guys. Uh, got a chance to play with my really good buddy Mike Knubel, who was my my line mate in college. And uh, it's just you know I, I look back at that team and I just I just can't figure out what happened there. I I know what happened. Yaroslav Halak is what happened in the first round. But yeah, I lose I lose sleep over that one for sure. Have you done fishing around? Have you done much fishing around Toba and Butte? You know, I haven't fished there a whole lot. Um, I know they're both great spots. I uh, I used to go up to Sonora Lodge. You know, when I played in Vancouver, we used to have derbies up there and, and kind of fished around Sonora Island a little bit. But uh, I haven't spent a lot of time up Butte Inlet or, or Toba. But uh, you know, it's, it's definitely on the list to do as well. It would be uh, just I know it's pristine and beautiful location. Uh, Hey, Brendan, which franchise do you resonate the most with? Well, for me, it has to be Vancouver. I just, you know, being from Vancouver, uh, playing the longest portion of my life in Vancouver and, and really probably having the best years of my career in Vancouver, uh, you know, playing with Marcus and Todd and, you know, we played on, uh, you know, some pretty exciting teams, you know, we were never out of games. It was, it was, uh, it was a fun brand of hockey to play. Are you going to get an next episode uh, bucktailing for big rainbows in the Okanagan? Yeah. You know what? I, I got it. That's another thing too. Like my wife's from Penticton. I've never really figured out the, the, the big, uh, the big uh, rainbows in Okanagan Lake. Um, I know they're in there and I know a lot of guys catch them on downriggers, but uh, yeah, that'd be a fun episode to do for sure. Uh, or even the shoe swap. Hey, Brendan, who was the scariest enforcer to play against for the West coast express era? Man, there's a lot of tough guys in the league at that time. Obviously, I, I never went near any of those guys. But, um, you know, at the time, Ty Domi, right? I mean, he, I mean, this guy's 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, He'd fight everybody 6'4", six, 6'5", six, and, and, and win. But, you know, we had Donald Brashear in, uh, in, uh, in Vancouver, who at the time was, you know, might have been the toughest guy in the league. Uh, George O'Rock in Edmonton. You go to, uh, you know, Bougard in minnesota there's a lot of big big tough scary guys chris simon he was kind of towards the end of his career uh bob probert was near the end of his career but yeah you had to keep your head up uh have you thought about filming a spring turkey hunt with your good buddies yeah absolutely i have i actually just got back from turkey honey i was i went down to north dakota and uh had a phenomenal trip down there we went down to uh, uh about an hour south of bismarck and um yeah, it, again, just great exercise. You're out, you know, I think a couple of days there, I might have hiked 10 miles and just beautiful, beautiful country. And, uh, 
again, it's, it's the game, right? It's the challenge. It's, you know, are you spotting, you're stalking, you're calling, you're, it's, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I've thought about it. I've thought about it for sure. What was it like having a guy like Olin in the locker room? Was he a vocal leader or was he quiet, quietly, or was he quietly a boss? Yeah, Oli was more, I'd say quietly a boss. Like, uh, you know, there'd be the odd time when he'd get fired up, but it would, it would take him a lot to get fired up. You know, he, the Swedes and Canadians have very, very similar uh, demeanors, mentalities. They're pretty laid back takes a lot to get certain guys fired up but i mean we, we just knew Oli was a horse man like every night uh he'd battle against other teams top lines and you know and jovo as well would do that and but uh yeah he uh he would put his body on the line and sacrifice uh, absolutely anything for his teammates oh any chance you and steve ranella do an episode together yeah man that'd be awesome i'd love to yeah we that's one thing we've chatted about this year about our show is, uh, you know, how do we kind of take it to the next level? Is it, you know, keep doing what we're doing, keep going to these awesome places, but also you don't want to, we don't want to alienate, you know, local people as well. So we try and focus on local shows and then we do some travel shows. So we want to, we want a good mix. Um, but, but hooking up with Steve Rinella would be sweet. I think, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's passionate, obviously, about the outdoors. That's his life. And if we could ever make that contact, it would be awesome. Uh, what are your memories of playing with Messier? Well, I, I got to play with him for 11 games when I got traded to Vancouver in, in 2000. And, uh, you know, I, the Oilers were a team I watched a lot when I was a young kid. And uh, so getting in the locker room with him, it was you kind of found yourself just staring at him. Like, what is, how does this guy prepare? You know, what is, what's his routine? Like, how does he handle himself? So he, he definitely had an aura. There's no question, right? Like, uh, when he talked, you could hear a pin drop in the locker room. Guys were just quiet. You know, he, he was great to me. Again, I only had him for 11 games, but I remember when myself and Dennis Peterson came over the very first game we had, he just said, Hey boys, uh, you know, pregame meals on me today where this is where we go to eat and kind of took us out for pregame meal, made us feel welcome and a part of the team. And and anytime you you go into a situation where you don't really know a lot of guys and you're new, it's, it's always awesome to have people reach out and make you feel part of the group right away. Uh, What was your worst experience in rough water? But I got to tell you, it was probably this summer or this September fishing in the uh, race for the blue uh, tuna derby. This is the first time in my life I've actually turned back from heading offshore. And we had to go a long way out. These tuna, we, we, we didn't start fishing until about 55 miles offshore, 50 miles offshore. So that's a long run. But we went out one day. The weather wasn't good. It was windy. It was raining. We, t- we were taking water not only over the bow, but over the roof of the boat. And, uh, you know, it, it comes a point in time where, you know, certain things <laughs> just aren't worth the risk. So we made the decision to uh, turn around and head back. And it was so bad. We, we couldn't even quarter back into the waves back the way we came out. We had to head up to a hot springs cove. We tucked into hot springs cove and, and, and actually uh, anchored up there for a little while or tied up to the, the government dock to kind of wait out the storm a bit. But yeah, that was, uh, that was not enjoyable. Who's your favorite stand-up comedian? Uh, <laughs> Bill Burr. I got to go with Bill Burr. I've seen him in person a couple times, and uh, <laughs> just his delivery, man, just cracks me up. That guy. Which team is most likely to bring the cup back to Canada? In your opinion, I, I think. Wow, we got two two Canadian teams left right now. I think it's Calgary. Like I, I think they have a legitimate chance um, to go all the way. Now, this Colorado St. Louis series is going to be a barn burner, but uh, the abs, the abs are dangerous. But uh, you know, I, I like Markstrom. I think out of all the goaltenders in the West, I would, I would give the nod to Markstrom. And we all know how goaltending can win or steal a series. Uh, just look at that last series between Calgary and the Stars and. And how uh, <laughs> how uh, Ottinger uh, played. I mean, he almost single-handedly won that series. Um, where are we at here? Who is owning 
this year's boat? Who is owning this year's boat? So the last couple of years, uh, our Kingfisher boat, um, kind of the setup we had is we would fish on a new boat and, uh, and then, um, uh, Parksville Boathouse would take the boat back and sell it. Well, this year we've, over the years with our, our relationship with Kingfisher, we, we've been able to work out an arrangement where we, Real West Coast, are keeping this boat at the end of the year. So this is going to be our boat moving forward and for many years to come. So it's getting dialed in right now at Parksville Boathouse. It's getting rigged and uh, we can't wait to get on it. Uh, what story can you tell us about being teammates with Scott Gomez? Yeah, so Gomer came in. Uh, he's an absolute beauty. We had some good times together, man. I don't know if anybody listened to Spit and Chicklets podcast. He's been on a couple times, but uh, it was funny. I, I I hadn't heard of this one particular episode when Gomez was on there, and uh, and he started telling some stories about him and me and some other guys when we were with the Devils. And next thing I know, my, my son was like eighteen at the time, two years ago. He was like, "Hey, Dad." Um, you never told me about that time in, you know, in, in Carolina or, you know, when you're out with Scott Gomez and this is what happened. I'm like, how, how do you know about this? He's like, well, he was talking about it on spit and chicklets. I'm like, what? <laughs> so we had a lot of good times together, man. He's a funny dude. Like, uh, just a beauty, just a beauty. What he, uh, yeah, good dude, man. Good dude. Um, love real West coast. Any plans of an episode near Port Renfrew or my Stomper grounds? Knit that. Yeah. We've talked about Renfrew a bunch too. And we know a bunch, a lot of guys down there, man. That's, uh, and, and the fishing's great. Um, it's on our list. Yeah. I hope to get down there. I know that knit that area would be great too. So, uh, I don't know if we'll be able to get there this year, but it's definitely on our list, uh, to, to do for sure. Were you a, and Bert familiar with each other in your draft year before playing together. And how was Joe was leadership in tough situations? So Bert and I didn't know each other before, um, before we became teammates. I mean, I'd played against him obviously, but you know, he played in the OHL and, uh, and I played, uh, I went to college hockey. So we never overlapped uh, when we played junior um, because I went to university and he played in the O. So I didn't know anything about Bert before I got to Vancouver and even got to Vancouver. You know, I, I didn't play with him until like my second two and a half years in, you know, I, my first year there, I kind of played with bounced around with some guys. My second year was kind of Matt cook, Peter Schaefer played the next half season with those guys. And then I kind of got put with Bert and Nazi, but yeah, I know we have a good relationship. We, uh, you know, we'd always give it to each other on the plane for whatever reason. We'd, we'd always have these like, monumental wrestling matches on the plane like uh yeah we, we had a good time together uh do you still skate at all yeah you know what i, I get out the odd time the flames here uh have an alumni skate over the winter down at the saddle tome and it's getting younger and younger every year but i, I like to go out i enjoy the skate a lot man it um it uh it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun it um we get guys from Lanny out there at times uh, to um, Colin Patterson and, and uh, uh, Joel Otto can't skate anymore. He's had some surgeries, but we've had a bunch of guys, but now we're getting younger guys, Matt stage and Gl Curtis Glenn cross has been out there. Uh, Sarich, Regeer. We get a good mix. We get a lot of guys. Uh, so it's a fun skate. I enjoy it. And then I do a lot of charity skates as well. Uh, Hockey helps the homeless. Yeah, I've done that in Vancouver and in, in Calgary. Um, Gordy Howe Cares, I've done that in Calgary a few times. Uh, uh, Canuck Autism Network, the CAN tournament that's hosted in, in Vancouver. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to be uh, drafted by Bob Shanks three times. And, and uh, the guys that I played with on that team have been awesome, like a lot of fun. So, yeah, I still enjoy it. I still enjoy skating. Um, whew, what are you going to name the new boat? <laughs> it's a work in progress. That's a work in progress. We got, uh, we got, um, um, <laughs> we got a couple of names. I don't want to share them right now. I, I, I want to, I want to 
make sure we get this we get this nailed down i got a couple you know it's one of those things you go with a serious name like you know my my personal vote before was was real season and it had like you know a knock like r-e-e-l season so it was kind of knock when i played hockey like hockey wasn't my real season fishing was and i had a hockey stick under it so i sold that boat and i become really good friends with that guy who owns it now and and he loves that name so i've kind of he's had that name now so i, I don't know if i I got to figure it out here, but I've got, I got a couple funny ones and I got a couple serious ones. So I got to, I got to, got to get that figured out. Uh, 1399 enough for a West coast fishing trip with you. Ha <laughs> ha JK 1390 won't even buy you a beer in the dome anymore. You take people out fishing. <laughs> yeah, dude. And I saw here at the PGA championship this weekend, golf, they're charging 18 bucks for a beer and 19 for a Stella. Like that's ridiculous um yeah beer prices are uh they're 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 expensive not only your tickets but yeah i guess they're uh yeah it's out of control that's all i can say but uh you know what i, I don't i don't really do any guiding to be honest with you i i go out just personally you know obviously take buddies and friends out but do some charity i've donated trips to charity events for sure and taking people out that way but um yeah we'll uh Maybe we'll see on the water at some point. Uh, oh yeah, here's a, a, a trip we did last year was on uh, on the Columbia out of uh, out of Revelstoke with Chad Deschamps. Super good dude, man. Great, great guy. Gives Delta Pro staffer uh, just dialed in on that river. And uh, Chad, have you thought about doing a hunting fishing episode? You know, I have. I have thought about it, and and. Uh, I've actually talked to wild TV about it too. And, and so I got, you know, there's almost, there's only so much time, right. That you have, but uh, you know, that might be something to look at, like kind of a crossover show to see, uh, do a half and half and kind of see what the feedback is, see if people like it, but yeah, definitely open to the idea. Uh, spring hunt and Revy. Hey man, it's coming up. Well, it's here. I might have to reach out to you, bud. We'll chat. <laughs> Have you done much fishing in the couch and valley? No, not a lot. Not a lot. I know, uh, I know the couch and river is, it can be world-class um, trout fishing, you know, rainbows and, and big browns, steelhead in there. Uh, you get salmon, coho as well, but uh, you know, I have not spent a lot of time there, but again, it's, you know, I've kind of got this master list of places I want to go. And then, and, and, and that, uh, that river is on that list for sure. Yeah, Quatsino Sound, Winter Harbor. Yeah, I fished out a, a KO Lodge out of Quatsino Sound here two years ago. And um, and uh, yeah, it's it's an awesome, awesome place, man. Like, uh, so never quite made it up to Winter Harbor, but uh, I know like uh, a couple guys that have been up there, they got some salmon derbies, tuna derbies. It's a great spot, kind of right at the north, north uh, west tip of... Uh, Vancouver Island so uh yeah we, we'd definitely be open to going back there again who's your who's your favorite NHL coach you ever played for huh well I had a, I had my fair share I, I played on seven different teams um I think the I think the guy that uh and I only had him for a very short period of time in New Jersey but a guy that uh was very very impressive was Jacques Lemaire Total different style of coaching, you know, didn't interact with the players at all. Uh, but his knowledge of the game, his intimate knowledge of the game, you know, the puck's here, this is where you put your stick. The puck's here, this is where you got to have your pick, your body and your stick. This is how you angle. You know, as a player and, and you know, how many cups he won in Montreal, I mean, his, his, his attention to detail is something I've never seen, ever. But for me, personally, my career, I, I would say um, – and he, and he was hard on me, Mark Crawford, but, you know, he gave me a, a great opportunity in Vancouver. He uh, showed a lot of faith in me as a player, played me in all kinds of situations, uh, power play, penalty kill, took a lot of big face off in our D zone. Um, yeah, so he, uh, he probably had the biggest impact on my career as far as, you know, me, me kind of morphing into the player that I was. Uh, Kevin Bx uh, said that during his first NHL game, he passed you a suey, and then he tried checking the guy who checked you. 
what do you think of his first game? What do you think of him then and now? <laughs> it's funny because I kind of knew a little bit about Kevin before um, before we met because we had the same agent, Kurt Overhart. So, you know, I went through college at Michigan. Kevin played at uh, Bowling Green. I'd heard through my agent that the Canucks are signed this kid. You know, you can't wait till he comes up and you meet him. You know, when he first came up, you know, like a lot of young guys, he didn't say a word. Like he was so quiet. He was so nervous. And, um, you know, he was respectful. He, he uh, you know, he just kind of sat back and, and uh, trying to watch and, and learn from guys. And, you know, obviously uh, we all know that he's not quiet today, right? He, uh, he could talk a dog off a meat wagon, but, um, you know, he's doing a fantastic job on, on Hockey Night in Canada, man. He's, uh, but we, uh, we have a good relationship. There'll be times when he's on Hockey Night in Canada, I'll, I'll text him as he's doing stuff and, and he'll get back to me right away. Um, yeah, great guy, good relationship with him. And uh, yeah, I don't exactly remember the sui that he gave me, but uh, I, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. How do you meet my buddy Lance from Tofino? <laughs> Pretty damn good fisherman too. Yeah, Lance is a good dude, man. It's funny, Lance is from Ontario. He came out to Tofino probably 20, 25 years ago. The first time I met Lance is when I moved over to Tofino. Uh, I was moving a bunch of furniture into my house and uh, just through the grapevine, I put out a note like, hey, if there's anybody, I was talking to my neighbor and, and uh, asking if they knew anybody that could you know, possibly help me like carry beds in, couches in. And uh, Lance and uh, Lutz showed up. That's the first time I ever met those guys. And to this day, we're all good buddies. Like I fish with Lance a ton. When I go back there, I try to get out on his boat. He comes out on my boat. We've done a show together. We caught two, uh, you know, beautiful halibut, uh, double headers that were just phenomenal fish. Um, but yeah, he's uh, he's a good dude, man. We stay in touch. I still text him every couple of days, get a fishing report, see what's going on. Um, whew. Any plans for Lake Trout out episode? Uh, <laughs> preferably with Willie. Yeah, preferably, preferably with Willie in a kayak so we can provide some more entertainment, I'm sure. <laughs> that was a gong show. Yeah, I want to get up uh, either northern Alberta, northern Saskatchewan, or even to the Yukon or Northwest Territories chasing big lake trout. Yeah, I don't know if we can make it happen this year, but I, I definitely, uh, that's on the list to do. Favorite fish to catch? Oof, man. Oh, I've been lucky. I've caught a lot of fish, you know, marlin, blue marlin tuna striped marlin but i'll tell you probably the one fish that is the wildest fish to catch would be a tarpon on the fly that has to be number one i mean uh and i hate being a west coast guy i hate going away from like your salmon tuna halibut trout steelhead steelheads they're all awesome i love them all but sight fishing for tarpon on a fly you can see a fish anywhere from 20 to 200 pounds moving through the water like a submarine and you get in position to cast a dry fly and if that fish turns and you're strip 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 and he takes it oh my forget about it like shut your mouth it's uh that thing your your reel will be hot that fish will be screaming hundreds of yards off off that line it's uh it's quite the adrenaline rush uh, big surge in West Coast Express episode would be a killer episode. Yeah, you know what? We've talked about, I've actually talked to Marcus and Todd about getting them on an episode and they're down with it. So we're going to try and make that happen. It's not going to happen this year, but next year, I think that's something that we're, we're really going to really going to try and make happen. My biggest surgeon was just over nine feet, nine feet, one inches, beautiful fish. It was about an hour and 15 minutes. Um, yeah, it was... Uh, I, remember, I, I caught that in 2000, 2007. That would have been 15 years ago. But, uh, man, unbelievable fish. Uh, hey, Greg, what's up, dude? Brennan, question from Carolyn. I have a school project where we have to invent something unique. Mine is a fish hook with a camera in it. Have you heard of such a thing? That's a great idea. Like, I've heard of cameras that you can hook up to, like, your downrigger or even to your main line that tries and, you know, but it would still be, you know, three, four, five, six feet away from your fish. 
So there are certain camera angles that you can get, but if you could get like a micro camera into the hook, I think you're on to something. I think uh, I'd love to try that out and promote it. Let me know when you get the patent. We'll do this. <laughs> um, we've got two more questions here, guys. I appreciate uh, the time. I hope I'm hope you're getting a little bit of insight here and uh, not taking up all your time tonight. This is again it's something new, something fun, and uh, yeah, I hope you're enjoying the content. We just uh, subscribe and. We'll try and do this a few more times. Uh, hey, Brennan, could you speak more about fishing with Kipper and also uh, how he was in the locker room? Yeah, again, Kipper was, uh, you know, he, I played against him for so many years and um, he was such a dynamic goaltender and such a huge part of the backbone um, of the Flames every time we played them. And we, and we knew we'd always face a phenomenal goaltending, but the odd time, you know, you'd get a little smile out of him as an opponent, but, you know, he was so deadpan. And then when I came here, he didn't really know what to, what to make. Like, Hey, is this guy, is he serious all the time? And like, then the, the Finns have a little bit different demeanor than, than the Swedes or the other Scandinavians. They, they always look so serious. And, uh, but once you get to know him a bit, his humor is, it's, it's, it's so subtle and it just catches you off guard. And it's, uh, it, it's great, man. I had a lot of good times. Even though I was only in, in, in Calgary for a short period of time, like uh, really had a lot of fun with him. What was it like on the 2004 World Championship team and playing with Scott Niedemar? What about, him, what about him made him so special? Yeah, so our 2004 World Championship team was, uh, was a really, really good team. Like our roster, if you look at it, we had a stacked team in 04 and 05. In uh, in 05, we we lost the gold medal game to uh, to the Czechs, but in 04, yeah, needs I've known needs for a long time. So I played with him in New Jersey um, when I first turned pro. So uh, my my first 97, 98, 98, 99, and then part of the 99, 2000 season before I was traded to Vancouver. So such a good guy. Like even to this day, uh, we we still talk. Um, you know, frequently we, we've, we've done, uh, ski trips together. Um, he, uh, such a competitive guy, again, a quiet leader, but an absolute horse on the ice. Like you can match him up against anybody, uh, could, could play in his own zone, could defend, but also put up offensive numbers, quarterback, power play, just his compete levels off the charts and his conditioning. Like you play 30 minutes a night, and uh, he'd, he'd come in after the game. He wouldn't even, he wouldn't even have sweat in his hair. It's like, dude, how do you do, how do you do that? Meanwhile, he's been battling, you know, Jagger all night or whoever, Lemieux all night or all the top guys, Forsberg, Sakic. And uh, he's playing head to head against those guys. And uh, he, he made it look so easy, so effortless. Um, a great story about him. We'll, we'll finish off with, with this, uh, with, with, with this story here. Um, so he came out to visit me in, in Tofino a couple of years ago, his family, they were, they were, uh, traveling out there. So we, we went out paddleboarding one morning. He's a big paddleboarder being down in Newport beach and me being in Tofino. So, uh, we went out, I think it was like, you know, about eight o'clock or whatever. And, and he's just like, you know, Mo, I gotta, I gotta be in. I got a phone call here at nine o'clock. I'm like, yeah, no problem. We'll go in. It's, it's no big deal. So, uh, it's like 10 to nine. I'm, like needs it's uh it's, it's 10 to 9 and you got a phone call he's like yeah man but these waves are so good right now he's like ah he's like i can get that call later i'm like all right like i i knew nothing what was going on so um you know later in the day i, I see this announcement come across my phone uh you know scott niedemeyer uh just uh inducted into the hockey hall of fame so i call needs i'm like needs was that the phone call you were supposed to be on this morning He's like, yeah. I'm like, dude, you like you, you put off the phone call that you're supposed to get, and that was your phone call to get inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame for like Lanny to call you and tell you you're going into the Hall of Fame. He's like, yeah. I'm like, well, that that sums him up right there, man. Pretty pretty laid back, low key guy. But uh, I thought that was uh, I thought that was just <laughs> unbelievable. But uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll we'll cap it at that. 
and uh appreciate all the questions guys that, that was awesome um i hope it was fun for you it was fun for me to kind of relive a lot of those memories you know going back uh kind of through time and and um yeah a lot of fun good time but uh appreciate appreciate you guys tuning in uh you know maybe just if you, if you could on your end here um you know tune into the show you know we're, we're, we're putting together some more uh, more episodes this year uh you know, we're trying to make it as upbeat and as fun as possible. And we want to hear feedback from you guys. Like if you guys, you know, tonight it's good. You, you throw out a bunch of ideas, which is awesome. If you guys have other ideas you want to see, shoot us a message on Instagram, uh, YouTube, uh, you know, get on, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel there. Um, that's big for us and uh, shows us, shows us a lot of support on your end. So we appreciate that. So we'll wrap this up here and uh, yeah, we'll look forward to doing this. Maybe. Uh, maybe uh some other time down the road here not too long okay enjoy uh, enjoy the third period of the uh colorado st louis game all right thanks guys have a good night